Thank you, Doug. Let me join my colleagues in welcoming you all to an amazing meeting, uh, largest crowd ever. So when I was invited to speak on this topic, my first question was, am I covering all of management of IBD in my 20 minutes? And how do I break this down into some usable information? And then I realized who else was, in, was speaking during the session, and I realized this would be a perfect way to tie everything we just heard together. So let's go through this uh, and think a little bit about how we might use algorithms and the concept of flow in our practice to manage our IBD patients a bit better. So I'll start by doing what my colleagues have done preceding me, which is to define our terms. And the term I want to start with is to explain to you what flow is. So forgive me for diverting our discussion from IBD just for a second to teach you about a sociologic concept called flow. There's a sociologist who used to be at the University of Chicago, Chicago named Mahali, who developed this concept that flow is when you're adequately challenged and doing what you do well at the volume in which you can best handle it. In other words, you're in a groove. You're doing what you like and you're doing it okay and you're handling what's happening. When you're not in flow, you're either in a state of anxiety or boredom and you have to figure out what's driving you away from flow. Are you being asked to do more than you can? Are you being asked to do something you're not adequately skilled to handle? Now, how is this relevant to clinical practice? Well, everyone in the room is already thinking about whether they're in flow or not most days. I know you are. And how can you incorporate this into your practice? Well, transform the dull jobs into opportunities for novelty and achievement. Pay attention to what you're doing. Ask yourself all the time, am I doing things that are absolutely necessary or should they be done by somebody else or done at all? And manage stress by establishing your priorities. And when you're feeling stressed, ask yourself, why am I not where I need to be? So that's my public service announcement as we get into managing IBD and thinking about algorithms. Now, algorithms actually can get you into flow because if you can streamline some of what you do to manage your patient population, you can appreciate how this might make your day-to-day -day existence in taking care of complicated patients much better. It provides a framework for thinking about clinical problems. It clarifies a stepwise procedure. And as I'm showing you here in this uh, original paper from 1983 when the concept of clinical algorithms was introduced, it helps you identify the complex relationships between clinical states and subsequent decisions decisions. Now, over time, people have criticized algorithms because they don't require you to think. And I would challenge that concept to say that actually, to use these well, you need to think extra hard and to do it the right way. So thinking is key. And if it works properly, it'll improve patient outcomes and improve the efficiency of your care, improve the efficiency of your practice, and return you to that state of flow. The algorithms for IBD have been variously described uh, through the years in ways that I think are, are flawed, and we've come to acknowledge that, and the speakers before me have pointed out a variety of reasons why this is a problem. We have the old-fashioned pyramid on the left, which doesn't really represent our patient population, nor does it adequately represent the therapies available to us. And the more recently described step-up strategy, where patients are on one stair or another, and they have to fail one treatment strategy or be uh, otherwise intolerant to it before they can move on. The challenges to those older approaches is that they tend to be more reactive. They don't reflect the heterogeneity of patient populations. It's what the oncologists call dirty therapy. You give everyone the same thing and see who responds, and then you decide if you're going to move on. It therefore has the problem of really violating one of our principles in medicine, which is to, to avoid doing harm. In fact, in IBD, the traditional strategy previously, and even the labels for some of our current therapies, require a patient to do poorly before you can get them to the next level, and that's a big problem. The other challenge to these strategies is that our newer therapies always get added to the end. You know, the old saying that the sickest patients get the newest drugs is because you ran out of all the other options, and we haven't done a good job repositioning our treatments and thinking carefully about that. Now, there exist some algorithms for the management of Crohn's in UC, and I don't presume to take you through those here, except to point out a couple of common uh, approaches to them that exist in the current literature. One is that they start off with the disease uh, severity, or at least the disease activity, as Corey is now teaching us, how sick is the patient sitting in front of you, and then take you through some different decisions along the way, waiting for the patient to achieve some defined symptom improvement, or else you move along. And so those exist for Crohn's, of course, and they exist similarly for ulcerative colitis. 
The problems with these algorithms is that they exactly follow the problems of our older strategies of requiring you to move through steps and wait for patients to either respond or not respond without any real thought to them. So I'm not here to encourage you to use these other than to teach some basic principles of how we treat IBD in other ways. In order to study this properly, it's really complex. Jean-Fred did a nice job introducing you to something called the REACT study, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But in order to do this properly, you have to have a hypothesis and clarify your endpoints. You need to use evidence to provide some parts of your algorithm so you understand when you might incorporate different strategies and different treatments. And you have to understand why you might use one treatment strategy or another earlier in the algorithm. And you have to then think about how do you time this? When would you look? When do you remeasure? When do you reassess? The devil is always in the details. You also have to recognize the tremendous heterogeneity in IBD, not just in Crohn's, but of course in UC as well. You have to understand when or how you might wash out therapies before you move to another one, or whether you would continue to treat through one strategy while you're moving to the next. And remember, of course, that we need to be thinking. Choose the right patients. Don't just plug everyone into the same algorithm as you move through it. So one of the first studies of algorithms in IBD is the study that many in the room will remember quite well, because for a long time we called it the step-up, top-down study. It was a study of early combination therapy with infliximab loading and azathioprine maintenance uh, compared to step-up, which was steroids, steroids, all the way up to infliximab after they needed it. And this was designed for early or at least um, new diagnosis of Crohn's within four years. The algorithm looked like this, and the study design had a hypothesis that top-down or early combination or early more aggressive therapy would have a better um, clinical outcome than the step-up strategy where steroids were used and we had to work our way through treatments. So it makes pretty good sense. It was based predominantly on the old-fashioned CDAI without any endoscopic entry criteria. And here's the primary outcome. Many people don't remember this. The primary endpoint of the study, which was a CDAI defined remission at two years was not significant between the two arms of the study, but that was largely because everyone regressed to the same therapy by the time they got to two years. What they did notice was that earlier in the uh, uh, analysis, patients responded much better to top down. In other words, the earlier therapy that John Fred now showed you a variety of lines of evidence to back up definitely works faster. And importantly, one of the other secondary endpoints, and I'll point your attention to the uh, bars on the left, was that the patients who received the top-down strategy of infliximab loading, azathioprine maintenance, and then subsequent infliximab if needed, had much more mucosal healing than those who were stepped up. Now, the interesting thing that I always loved about this study is they followed the patients who healed, regardless of which arm they were in, for an additional two years and demonstrated the benefit of mucosal healing. So this was one of our earliest studies looking at an algorithmic approach to IBD, but there were a lot of unanswered questions and some challenges to incorporating this into practice that many of you are quite familiar with. In other words, we shouldn't just give everybody with Crohn's disease the top-down strategy. That doesn't work at all. It has to be the right patients who have the right risk, the right uh, risk of progression and the right risk of complications. And we heard beautifully from Corey who those patients might be and how we might use a disease severity index to understand who we might choose to do such things. Now, uh, Jean-Fred also mentioned to you this concept of treating to achieve a target. So one of the equalizers to understanding whether we should be moving to some of these algorithmic approaches is instead of just saying we want clinical improvement or some other measure, we might choose a target that enables us to sequentially and serially move through therapies until we either hit the target run out of options or the patient or the physician says that they're not comfortable moving to the next level. The presumption is that if you achieve the target, it's likely to improve quality of life because you're controlling the disease. And very importantly, and not often enough discussed, is that we will change the natural history of the disease, which is the prevention strategies that John Fred talked about. Um, so how do you do this? Well, first of all, it's not the same target for everyone. It's not just mucosal healing for everyone. You have to understand what your target might be, and it can be individualized as well, especially for the teen or for the pediatric patient, understanding restoration of growth and development. But for many other patients, there may be some individualized targets that make good sense. And some surrogates are reasonable to be used if you know that they correlate well with the gold standard of endoscopy and biopsies. You also were introduced to, to this IOIBD initiative, which was essentially a consensus statement on what the targets might be for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. 
targets that include patient reported outcomes, which is essentially symptoms and improvements in quality of life measures, along with something objective like endoscopic improvement, or in the case of Crohn's, cross-sectional imaging improvement. So thinking carefully about in your individual patient, what should be the target, your goal for managing them, and how are you gonna get there without letting them languish and have progression of disease is really key. Now an interesting concept and important to mention is that at least in the consensus statement at the time that the literature was reviewed, both CRP and CalPRO were considered adjunctive but not primary targets. So we have to think a little bit about how you position those and in whom you might use them best. Now a strategy that's algorithmic to use treat to target to manage IBD really uh, can look a little bit like this. A baseline assessment of disease activity, a choice of initial therapy based not only on the current severity of the disease, but also that disease severity index or what's gonna happen to them prognostically, followed by reassessment of the disease activity, working towards whatever target you're trying, and after a defined period of time, if you actually have achieved your target, you enter the period of disease monitoring, so recognize that the patient doesn't just stay there forever, there's a risk they're gonna drift away, or you continue to move through additional steps in management until you get to where you need to go. And so that's important and that involves shared decision making with your patient. If the patient says, by the way, I'm not comfortable going to that next level of therapy, this is where you do clinical follow-up or have other discussions and continue to bring them back or consider clinical trials, et cetera. So this is very important to keep in mind. This is an algorithm, but it's individually adjusted to the patient in front of you. The outer circle is the treat to target algorithm and the inner circle ends up being disease monitoring, which is equally, if not more important. Now, in the real world, we've learned from a variety of studies, including this retrospective analysis by Bill Sanborn and colleagues, that treat to target is actually possible. So in this uh, example, in ulcerative colitis patients in their practice, if they were not healed when they had an endoscopy, they were offered adjustments in either dose of their existing therapy or stepping up to the next level of therapy. And on average, with two adjustments, they were able to achieve healing, not only endoscopically, but histologically in most patients. So it suggests that it's not just an exercise in futility in some patients where we go through these maneuvers, but we can actually achieve the goal we're trying to do. Now, it can be quite complicated to try to move into um, this in clinical practice. So Jean-Fred explained to you something called the REACT trial. This was the first cluster randomization study in uh, IBD, and this represented randomization of practices, not patients. And so this is why he didn't show you the algorithm, but I am because my talk is about algorithms. Look at what this algorithm involved. And it involved identifying patients with active disease and then reassessing their disease with some objective measure at different components and then working through the addition of other therapies, the dose adjustment of therapies, and trying to figure out if doing that in an algorithmic way compared to conventional management, which is what most of us were just doing in our practice, would result in better outcomes. Now, similar to the step up top down, study, the primary endpoint here was a more clinically based um, remission at two years. This was the Harvey Bradshaw index. And you see that by two years, whether you went through that complex algorithm or you were using conventional management, there was not a statistically significant difference. And in fact, even earlier in the study, there was not a difference. Now, some have said, well, that's because the patients weren't sick enough to show the difference. Others have said that's because conventional management is so close to the algorithm that the patients were essentially getting the same thing. But very importantly, as Jean-Fred reminded us, the secondary endpoints of surgery and hospitalization were reduced when you work through an algorithm approach like this. So is this gonna make our lives more complicated or is it actually gonna make us more efficient in practice? Well, I think the lesson learned here is that if you're using specific markers and moving through treatments so that you can get to a target with your patients, you are going to change the natural history of the disease. You are gonna prevent those outcomes that we all want to avoid. What about other algorithms in IBD? I just thought for a moment I would introduce you to using this in other ways in our practices. So here's an example of a paper we wrote where we described using a treat to target strategy for the patient who's refusing therapies. How often does that happen to all of us? So the patient says, you know, I'd really like to try diet to manage my Crohn's disease. I read something on the internet that sounds like you must have missed it in medical school, and um, I wanna manage my Crohn's disease this way. 
So uh, we don't always have to say, well, we don't know enough to do this or it's just not there yet, uh, which is a nice way of saying those things. We can also try to identify why they're pursuing those particular objectives. And what I really like about what we proposed in this paper is that we negotiate with the patient using an, an objective marker. We say, okay, fine, I understand why this is important to you. Let's agree that in six weeks we'll reassess your disease activity together and then move through that to something else if it's not getting you where you need. And frankly, if it is working, we're both going to be happy and we'll continue to follow together. So treat to target isn't just about getting them on the next biologic in the chain. It can be about a discussion you have with the patient to move them through complementary and alternative strategies as well, as long as they don't get harmed along the way. Now here's an algorithm that you um, might have seen or thought about is how do you approach dysplasia? Same concept, thinking carefully, but I'll point out the reason I'm showing you this algorithm is because some of our definitions have changed, our technologies have changed. We have to understand that where we might have in the past recommended a knee-jerk colectomy, we now recognize we can see lots of dysplasia, we can remove it, and therefore this algorithm enables you to do more active surveillance. So that's another example where an algorithm might be useful. And here's one that I find particularly helpful. It's the flow algorithm for the difficult patient, which might be defined as the one who doesn't like you, or maybe you don't like them as much. Um, I would recommend that you all incorporate this into your practice. You send this to my partner, Dr. Russell Cohen. That is his home phone number. He really enjoys people using it. Go ahead and snap those photos and keep the number handy. All right, and so lastly, you can incorporate algorithms and approaches to patients with uh, checklists. So you've seen some of this in practice before. Um, I do have a conflict here in saying that I'm involved in this nonprofit called Cornerstones, but there are some checklists available free to you that you can use in your practice and share with your partners and your nursing team. This is a checklist for monitoring and prevention of therapies, including cancer and vaccinations. The same checklist is also now available in Espanol, uh, so I encourage you to use that for some of your patients. And uh, new and announced at this meeting is a checklist now for continuity of care when a patient is moving to another state or when a pediatric or adolescent is transitioning to adult care. So you might find these useful uh, for your practice. This is another way to streamline what you're doing every day in a way that might make you uh, more likely to achieve flow. So with that, I'll summarize. Um, the use of algorithms can certainly help us in practice. It can certainly change the way we take care of our patients, and I hope it will definitely change the uh, natural history of disease, but it requires that you're thinking and that you use these to individualize your treatment, which is one of the reasons why I like Treat to Target and why you can really approach your patients using this without necessarily forgetting about the individual that's behind all that. So thank you very much. I wish you all a very good meeting.